Video games, just like every other form of media, are built on the shoulders of giants, taking inspiration from those that came before. And over the course of time, that inspiration manifests into some pretty common structural tropes. If you've ever wondered why so many games require you to get the three great MacGuffins before moving on, or why a ton of games generate random levels for you to play, you can probably thank old-school games like Adventure and Rogue. But one of the oldest recurring bits in all of games goes back to 1975 in the tabletop RPG Dungeons & Dragons, where at the end of a long dungeon-crawling session, a party would be faced with a dangerous enemy that's the only thing standing between them and an ultimate treasure. That trope is called a boss battle, and today it's used in just about any game that features a combat system. They're used to put an exclamation point on a chapter, to push a story forward, or to give a player a break from the usual gameplay loop with a unique and challenging encounter. Bosses are a central landmark in video games, and oftentimes, the best boss fights stick out to you as a representative part of the quality of a product long after you forget about the details about how you got there, which creates positive, long-lasting, non-trauma-inducing memories of a game. But when I look up videos, articles, and message board discussions, I don't see a lot of people having fun with the bosses in the fighting game genre. All I see is... Uh, I mean, this is insane! What the f***? This, this game. Oh my god! What move was that?! What move was that?! So in this video, I wanted to investigate what it is about fighting game boss design that makes them so hated, and share a few of my favorite bosses from the genre. So if you enjoy this video, please give me the pleasure of your subscription and a follow on Twitter. So first we need to understand that for a long time from the late 70s to 90s, poor game design was rather commonplace in the games that you would find on the market. Most console titles were only a few hours long if played from start to finish, so in order to extend the game's shelf life, you'd often see games resort to artificial difficulty, including incredibly tough platforming challenges or restrictive checkpointing systems that forced your average player to bang their heads against a wall until they got past whatever impossible challenge was in front of them. And that goes double for the arcade scene because these cabinets were prohibitively expensive. So the more you were able to get players motivated to continue to pump quarters into your machines, the more profitable your hometown arcade was for the developer and the arcade operator. In fighting game terms, this often means a final boss fight that keeps you agonizingly close from cementing your score atop the leaderboard, and enjoying that sweet, if often poorly translated, ending. Most of the time, the final battle is a one-on-one -on -one showdown against a character who hits like a truck or is able to pull out moves you've never seen before at a breakneck speed. And you know, this may sound controversial, but I actually don't think that there's anything wrong with that by itself. Because when you look at boss fights from other video games, every one of them have powerful sets of attacks that the player is just left to deal with. But the difference between those games and fighting games is that more often than not, the boss is acting independently of the player. They have set patterns and routines featuring attacks with long wind-ups, so even if you've never seen a specific attack before, you'll at least know how to avoid it the next time the boss decides to queue it up. But with fighting games where the final fight is just against a dude, there is no pattern. There's no long wind-up, it's just a straight-up fighting game match. It's a skill check in its purest form, saying, hey, remember what you did in the other eight stages of this arcade mode? Alright, now do it again, but better. These fights are designed to test the player's knowledge of their character's offensive and defensive tool set. But you and I both know that this isn't usually how it goes, and that's because there's one major conflict, a fighting game boss design that when added to the mix, turns your average boss fight into an absolutely nightmarish, SNK unfair level enemy. And that is human limitation versus artificial intelligence. Fighting game AI makes in-game decisions much like how you and I would. They take a look at the game state, distance, health, meter, opponent actions, and then think about all of the moves they can make, and then select one of those moves to perform based on what they think will give them the best return on investment. But unlike us meatbags, a computer can process these decisions so quickly that it kind of ruins the whole point of fighting games. 
The limit for humans reacting to a visual stimulus is about 200 to 250 milliseconds, or about 12 to 15 frames at 60 FPS. This limitation doesn't really apply to an AI, as they always have perfect information about the game state. And since they're not bound to silly human shortcomings like execution barriers, they can react to anything, with anything, as soon as frame one if they choose to do so. Whereas you may be able to trick a human into eating a combo as the result of a well-placed shimmy, or do five walk-up pile drivers in a row after a few rounds of Pavlovian-esque conditioning, your typical fighting game CPU can counter your attacks, not from anything you've done previously, but rather by the first few frames of whatever move you throw out in neutral. And when you combine this Miss Cleo level psychic ability with attacks that are intentionally overpowered, it often feels futile to fight these bosses like you would a normal opponent, leaving the door open for players to abuse holes in the AI's routines. Like how in The King of Fighters 94, Rugal Bernstein is built up to be an absolute bastard of a final boss, but can ultimately be overcome with the same strategy that you use to beat your six-year-old nephew. Crouching sweep and nothing else. Making the win a lot less satisfying because you're using the only technique that works instead of interacting with the opponent as the developer intended. Not only that, but this can cause the development of poor habits that can spur even more frustration when somebody who usually only plays against the CPU decides to venture out into versus mode. They may be discouraged to put a game down completely when they realize the one thing they've used to great success no longer worked when they face a person who can adapt in a way that a computer can't. And if you think that person doesn't exist, I would say that you're massively understating the amount of casual gamers that play fighters, and encourage you to check out the achievement stats for your favorite fighting games. Chances are, if there's an achievement for clearing a really low bar playing online versus, like ranking up one time or winning one game, that percentage of players who own those trophies will be way lower than clearing a significant amount of whatever single player content a fighting game has. So in order to sidestep all of these problems, some games opt to flip the concept of a traditional one-on-one -on -one boss fight on its head by blowing up the enemy to a massive scale, creating a monster boss. These fights are usually less frustrating than their regular-sized counterparts because it doesn't really matter whether or not a boss like Apocalypse from Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter can read your inputs or predict your every move because it's so far removed from a traditional fight that you're barely playing a fighting game at that point. The design of these bosses are closer to the encounters you'd see in just about any other video game, where it boils down to pattern recognition and loss mitigation rather than pure fighting game skills, so it's a lot more understandable when you get chunked for 70% of your health from an attack with a long windup that you had time to prepare for and avoid over an attack against a normal-sized enemy that does the same amount of damage from a single whiff punish. Say something I'm giving up on. Now, all of this isn't to say that you can't create a great boss fight between you and a normal sized enemy. Of course, that'll require leaps in the quality of fighting game AI, and unfortunately, not every game can have AI as good as Virtual Fighter 4 and Killer Instinct 2013. So instead, the best boss fights in the genre will often repurpose the mechanics of their games to make the act of fighting a little more engaging. Take for example, Them's Fightin' Hurts. On the surface, it's a cutesy little indie fighting game with an aesthetic so sweet that it'll make diabetics sick, but if you can get past its candy-coated exterior and dive into the creamy, nougaty center, you'll find that, yeah, the pony game is actually really good. It has a great tutorial, innovative training mode features, a cool online lobby system, and gameplay so quality that you know the people behind it know their fighting games inside and out. But they also knew that with a game that takes inspiration from this, will come a lot of people who've never touched a fighting game in their lives. So they had to make the single player content familiar to them while still being recognizable as a fighting game. I think a good example of this is the second boss fight in the first chapter of the game's story mode. Without giving away too many plot details, you play as Arizona, a rushdown character who wants to be in your face for as long as possible. Your travels eventually land you in a scrap with Velvet, the class zoner who wants you to stay as far, far away as you can. So at the outset, you're faced with a classic fighting game matchup where every inch matters. You need to show patience and you need to understand how to block in order to get past the first phase of this fight, which is just a straight up regular fighting game round. 
So you get that done, and Velvet gets up for round two, and much like your last bad relationship, you find yourself drifting further and further apart, but unlike your last relationship, this one is being ruined by a permanent version of Velvet's wind push move, forcing you to add in some dashes here and there. Get her down to half health in this form, and the fight changes to what's essentially a platforming challenge, where she throws out ice spikes that you need to avoid by jumping, ducking, and blocking. The beauty in this fight lies in the fact that it doesn't rely on straight up fighting to make it interesting, but instead augments the match every step of the way by focusing on one mechanic and uses it almost like a theme of the fight. Every boss fight in the story mode thus far has a similar progression, and despite the ever-present concerns about difficult AI, I'm really looking forward to the next chapters in this story mode. So between incredible gameplay, every little training mode feature you've ever wanted, and a bangin' single-player suite, it's a real shame that the only thing you can't do with them's fightin' herds is play it in front of your parents. Mom! It's not what it looks like. This game has really good net... This game has really good net code. Lastly, I wanted to talk about my all-time favorite boss fight in just about any fighting game. It's not gonna be at EVO, but I really felt the need to tell you all about it. That's right, if you haven't guessed it by now, the game that I'm talking about is Fight Night Champions for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. No, for real, this boss fight's actually incredible, and let me break down why. So, in the story mode, you play as scrappy young upstart Andre Bishop, working your way past the struggles of boxing life and shady promoters. You eventually find yourself in a fight for the World Heavyweight Championship, but the champion, Isaac Frost, won't go down that easy. He's overwhelmingly strong, as demonstrated by the previous fight where you control Frost with his unlimited stamina and through-the-roof stats. Luckily, your cornerman has some advice for you. Don't even try to win the first couple of rounds. Just survive. Let him tire himself out. Yeah, I got it. I mean it, kid! This guy's a friggin' animal! So for the first few rounds, you need to block, you need to defend, and you need to stay alive, which is easier said than done, because if you go after Frost, he can put you into the ground with a few punches. At the end of round three, Frost begins to breathe heavy. Your cornerman begins to pick up on that and tells you to start landing body shots over the next few rounds. I want you to go downstairs and give him some power shots now. I want you to chop that wood for three rounds. So after eight rounds of defending, going to the body, wearing down Frost's stamina, you finally get to go into the championship rounds, ready to unleash all of the energy you've been saving. This is your fight now, Andre. Take it to him. That's all you had to say, Gus. And when you do land that final punch that puts Frost down for the count, it feels incredible. It's a really well-paced fight, but you want to know my favorite part about this boss? The entire time, they're teaching you a basic boxing game plan. Tire them out, drag them into deep waters, and then finish them late. It's how Ali beat Foreman, how Stipe beat Cormier, how... I, I don't know, Mayweather beat McGregor. It's a real thing, and it can work against humans just as well as it worked against Frost. I think this is untapped territory for fighting game bosses, and I would really be interested to see if this style of boss can translate to other styles of games in the genre. So if y'all down in the comments have any suggestions for boss fights in a similar vein, let me know. Fighting game bosses are pretty limited by a number of things. Uh, oppressive artificial intelligence, the unnatural stiffness that comes with the genre's movement methods, and a pretty 90s design philosophy when it comes to these encounters. However, with just a little bit of imagination, they can teach, they can engage, and they can be just as exciting as any other video game for players of all skill levels. I'm sure that you all have your favorite boss fights and your reasons for making that boss your favorite, and I want to know too. Shoot me a comment telling me your favorite boss in a fighting game, and I'll play them on my Twitch channel at twitch.tv stumblebee. I hope to see you all there. Thank you once again for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it, please give me a subscription on YouTube and a follow on Twitter. Have a good one, and I'll see you next month. Son, when are you moving out of my house?